Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to be here with this wonderful church family. I've been blessed to spend many a Sabbath here, and I just pray that you uh, prepare all of our hearts for the message that you have for us today. Um, and we just want to thank you for saving us to serve you and to serve others. So, um, yeah, we just ask that your presence be here now in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Charlene, and I have had the blessed privilege of working with ADRA for over 16 years. Um, I've been able to work in the international department overseas and in Australia as well. I'm currently working in the national programs, and I'm really happy to see some of my colleagues over here. Uh, we've got Janina in HR and Gordon uh, looking after all our op shops. So you would have seen him on that disaster video at one of our responses. So great to have you guys here as well. Um, I'm just going to get straight to it and give you the, the punchline right at the beginning. Uh, so if you turn with me to Matthew 22:37, I'll let the Bible do the talking. Matthew 22:37, and this is our key text for the day that I'm actually not going to come back to. I'm just setting the scene here. Matthew 22:37. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your what? Heart and all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. For those who know me, uh, you would know that I love Japan. And the reason why I love Japan is I've been blessed to spend four years of my life living in Japan. Um, I went first when I was uh, after my first year of college, and then once again um, later in my life, I took a break, and, and some of my best years have been in Japan. And I want to tell you about my first memory of official service. And I was a first-year student. I got to the end of my, um, my first year, and God impressed me uh, in a very, very obvious way that I couldn't deny that I should go to Japan um, and do English and Bible teaching there. So I was pretty naive. I come from South Australia and South Australia never gets cold. So I actually didn't own, I've ne I had never owned a proper jacket or anything. And I landed in Japan in the middle of winter in Tokyo. I remember going to my, I got, it was late afternoon, I got picked up by the guy that would help um, induct me there, took, dropped me off at my accommodation, and I sat on my bed, freezing my butt off, going, God, what have I done? And I literally sat there panicking and freaking out in a country all by myself. I knew one person for an hour, and I was freaking out. I was 19, I'd just turned 19. And then I reminded myself that, hang on, God had sent me here. God was with me. So I spent the next few little while just praying to God, saying, give me courage to, to, to continue on this journey. The next day, um, I told my boss that I was freezing and I needed a proper jacket. So instead of going on induction, we went down to the uh, downtown. And I'm talking downtown Tokyo, the kind that, you know, those big intersections that you see on those movies and like a million people cross the road at once. We were in an intersection like that. And on the way, I'm like, oh, John, I, re I really need to find a bathroom. And he's looked around and he's like, oh, great. Look, there's just one over there. And as I walk to the bathroom, I'm like, oh, hang on, squat toilets. Sorry, I'm going to just warn you, we're going to talk about toilets for a minute. <laughs> and I panicked because I hadn't really processed, how do you even use a squat toilet? And so as I went in, praise the Lord, there was a Western toilet and a squat toilet. So I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and so I went in, and, and when I was done, I turned around to flush the toilet, and there was no button there. And I'm like, oh, hang on, this is a bit weird. Oh, no, no, Japan's like a really advanced country, so I was looking for some kind of sensor somewhere, and I just couldn't find the way to flush it. And eventually, I kind of looked down the, uh, where the, against the wall. There was this kind of big off-green button, but it kind of had a bit of newspaper with some sticky tape over it, and I thought... That is the only button to press. And so I lean down and I push the button. <laughs> the pan 
panic alarm went off in the middle of Tokyo. I ran out and there was about 20,000 people in my, my imagination that had stopped and were looking at me. And then I looked at John's face and he was horrified. And he's like, get it. And we literally ran away. <laughs> that night I got home, opened my diary and I wrote, day one service in Japan. <laughs> What has your service experience been like? Hopefully yours started out a little better than mine did. I actually, as I said before, I went on to spend four years in Japan and some of the best years of my entire life. Um, so I was very blessed. As Christians, we spend our lives doing our best to reach others for God, right? Ellen White says in Testimonies Volume 1, she says this, and I'm sure you've all heard this before, the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is what? A loving and lovable Christian. Now, the loving part is really easy because that's what about we, we do. You, you could tell me 10 ways of how you love other people. I do this and I do that and I help this person and that person, but the lovable part is from other people's perspectives. How many of us are, are lovable? Do we always act in a lovable way? Let's just ponder that for a few moments. Let's turn to Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 7. We're going to jump around a little bit in the beginning. Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 7. And what does Isaiah say to us? Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 7. This is God speaking, not Isaiah. Isaiah. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and, to, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light shall break forth like the morning, and your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. This is about heart service, all right? What did the Pharisees know about heart service? Were they good when it came to heart service? The Pharisees, all they wanted to do is to make sure everyone else knew what they were doing. And I can, I, I admit that there's a, there's a bit of that in me too. <laughs> um, just being honest, I'm going to be very open and honest with you today, so I hope you're okay with that. They just wanted to be seen as holy and religious. They used to walk around with these disfigured faces just so you know that they'd been fasting for three days. It was crazy. I even was looking up these phylacteries that they used to... I love that word, phylactery. Isn't it just a funny word? They would wear these phylacteries on their heads and bind them on their arms and make sure people could see them when they were praying. That kind of behaviour can fool some others around us, but we know deep down that it doesn't fool God. God would rather us spending time doing good rather than acting good like the Pharisees used to. 1 Peter 4.10. Let's go there. 1 Peter 4.10. I should pre-mark these because I get a little bit nervous and then it takes me ages to find it. 1 Peter 4.10. Here we go. We're talking about gifts. Who here has a spiritual gift? Who's bold enough to put up their hand that they have a spiritual gift today? Everybody's hand should be going up. Let's, we need to read this verse, all right? <laughs> As only two people in the church put their hands up, two people received a gift, what does the living word of God say? As each one has received a gift... Minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Each and every single one of us has gifts that God has given us to serve others. The text doesn't say just pick one and use the shiniest gift you have. It says whatever gift you have, use it. And I challenge you, if you don't know what your spiritual gift your spiritual gift is, take some time in the next few weeks to pray about it and ask God to show it to you so you can use it for his glory. And then you, yeah, so when we start using those gifts, those gifts are talents multiplied. And God doesn't supernaturally give us gifts and qualifications that we lack. 
He desires us to use what we have, and when, as we've heard before, it's like a muscle. The more you use it, the more you can bless others, and he'll increase our abilities and influence. <clears throat> but when talking, about mot- uh, when talking about service, something I want to just touch on is motivation. What motivates you to serve? And I'm going to leave you for a little bit of an awkward 30-second silence to actually think about a time recently where you served someone else What was your motivation? You don't have to share it. I just want you to awkwardly think about it. And the next question is, does it matter what our motivation is? I want to be honest with you and say that almost every time I serve, I have different motives. I'm admitting that I am human. Um, And is this something that you can also relate to? Can I see some, some heads nodding in support here? I want to I ask a question. Are you going to give me permission to be really vulnerable with you here? I'm asking you permission so you can't tell me off after. Is that all right? Okay, I'm going to share a list with you of all the things I could think of that have motivated me in my life to serve others. Okay, you ready? The love of God touching my life and I felt a desire to serve. That's a pretty good one, right? Pat on the back there. Hanging out with other people who serve and wanting to be a part of it. Seeing something that troubled me, like this stuff that's happening at the moment, just doesn't it just move you in your hearts and just it's just terrible. And, and, what it, and some things that anger you and you just want to act to make a difference. Being asked or pushed to because there was a need and no one else was putting up their hand to do it. A close friend or family member asked me, so of course I said yes. Some of my friends were joining in and I didn't want to miss out even though I didn't like the activity. The guy I liked at the time was joining in, so of course I put my hand up. (laughs) They always provide a great potluck after, so I'm in. (laughs) I don't like cooking, okay? I wanted the sanitarium goodie bag. Do you know how good some of those can be? And so, yes, I joined in to help. Because I would get paid for it. Pastor Neil said he would buy me churros after. So, yep, I did it. This is a hard one. Because I knew that lots of people would know that I helped. The media would be there, and I wanted wanted Adra's name to get publicised for the great work that they do. And because secretly, deep down, I like to be acknowledged for doing good things. What's your list of motivations to serve? And this is just my list, and this is also a reflection of my journey with God. God desires us to serve. Because he also, it, through serving, it actually brings us closer to him, and that's what God wants. And it brings us close to others. And he understands our hearts and where we are at, and he wants our hearts. The amazing thing about the love of God is, no matter where you are on that list of motivations, God will use you, and he will work with you to bring you to where he wants you to be. The good old saying is, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called, is very true. So applicable to us, no matter what formal qualifications we have or anything. Each day that we walk with God, we grow closer to him. And I don't know about you, but my life is very up and down when it comes to the the nearness of my heart to God. And I sometimes allow things into my life that I know will push God out of my heart and I'll suffer as a result. But praise God, service is a way for our hearts to be constantly drawn closer to him. I want to tell you about a story about a youth member. Um, I was involved in a disaster response once and I was actually leading it, but I was in a different location and that was really difficult. And so I had to, 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 to trust people on site, not trust, I had to find people on site to actually lead the, the on site um, response. And so I had a friend up there and I said, hey, can you go get this guy? I'm not going to say his name. Can you go get this guy? Because he's the youth leader 
And he's got a great bunch of youth. And if you can get them on board, we will have a power group to go out and help with the disaster cleanup. And so my friend went over to his house, knocked on the door. This is like a day after a massive disaster in his town. Knocked on the door, and the guy was on his computer games playing computer games. And my friend said, he's busy and he just doesn't want to get involved. And I said, go back and give him a bit of a kick. Anyway, he basically forced him away from his computer games, and they got a group together and they went out. After the first day, I checked in with my friend, and he said, you know what, today was a good day. Checked in the second day. Wow, it was amazing to see the difference in that guy. He's like so totally driven. And as each day passed, seeing the change in that guy as he led a group to serve others was just amazing. Sometimes we just need to give each other a little bit of a kick to get out of our comfort zones, to get out there and to serve people for God. I have lived in a, different, a few different countries um, in Asia and the Pacific and uh, been blessed to travel to many more. And in that time, I have also been very blessed to see the different forms of worship and the different ways that religions work around the world. I remember uh, when I was in Bangladesh, and Bangladesh was, it was, I remember getting the most sick I've ever gotten was in Bangladesh. I was a newbie and uh, I ate an apple, which is a very silly thing to do. Um, <clears throat> but I remember what, something that shocked me was when we went to a certain village, um, I walked in and I immediately noticed that the whole village was just pristinely cleaned. And I mean not a leaf, not anything. It was just pristinely cleaned. And I walked into this lady's house and it looked like she'd actually, because this is dirt, mud, brick, we're talking goats walking through, absolutely pristinely clean. And I asked the, the Adra translator that I was with, why is it that in this village everything is so clean? And she said, oh, that's simple. This is a Hindu village. And he went on to tell me that in the Hindu religion, if your house isn't clean, when the gods happen to come and visit, they won't enter your house. In Japan, um, Japan is a very culturally religious um, society. And why I say culturally religious is because often the, um, a lot of my friends and everyone, they were do it going through the motions, but they didn't actually believe what, it was more cultural than religious. And you go to any um, Japanese temple and you'll see everyone walking in, getting a, piece of in, uh, a stick of incense, lighting it, putting it in front of the, the god, standing there, clapping twice and bowing very deeply in reverence. But when it comes to Christians, how, how do we serve an unseen god? Colossians 1.5 um, says, He, God, He is the image, sorry, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. How do we serve? How do we physically serve an unseen God? We can't touch Him, we can't physically see Him, but He calls us to serve Him. So, how do we serve Him? Of, by serving others. Ten points. <laughs> By serving others. And I'm not going to get into the story, but Matthew 25 uh, talks about the story of the sheep and the goats. And the king replies in verse 40, it says, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me. And we can't get any clearer than that. There's a story about a man and his son down by the beach. And it was a hot day like today. It's a bit hot up here. I'd like to be at the beach. No. No. Um, and they were just frolicking in the water and having some real quality father-son time. And the little boy was diving down and pick, there was a, looking at all the rocks on the bottom of the sand and picking up these rocks and showing Dad. And as Dad went a little bit deeper, he looked down and he saw... Have you ever seen those blue starfish? He saw one of those blue starfish. It must have been in North Queensland because that's the only place I've seen them. And he dove down, and kids don't do this, okay, because it could be a, a poisonous one. This guy must have been a marine biologist, right? So he knew what he was doing. He reached down and he picked it up, and he, he, he hid it behind his back and, and swam over to his son and said, son, son, come and look what I've got. And the son popped up, and he's like, what is it, dad? And the dad pulled the beautiful starfish 
from behind his back. And the son looked at the starfish and went, wow, and looked at his rocks in his hands. And he said, that's great, Dad, and he swam away. And the dad was just shocked. Are we kind of like that? What do we have in our hands that we are treasuring that is stopping us from taking the amazing things that God has in store for us as blessings through service? What are we clinging on to that we see is more important and, than what God has planned for us in the fulfilling of the Great Commission? In my colourful imagination, I can almost see God handing over a golden opportunity to help someone and make a difference in their lives and, 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 and offering that to me, but I can't take it because I've got Netflix in one hand and my work in the other hand. What is it that you've got in your hands that you are holding on to that is stopping you from following God's leading in this way. True service is having both hands full, loving God and loving others. If you take just one thing away from this sermon today, it's this. I want to challenge you to pray to God over the next week and ask him for an opportunity to serve him and be specific. Ask for three. Why stop at one? Whatever it is, ask God and say, God, I want you to use me today. Pray to God with an honest heart and help us put down those things that don't matter so we can have our hands full with loving God and loving others. The second time I moved to Japan to live, um, once again, God was really clear and open in, in, in kind of forcing me to go back, which I was actually happy about. But... Um, the second time, I didn't have a clear picture of what God wanted me to do. And it was actually a, an amazing experience, the whole two or three weeks where God was trying to convince me to go back. And I was traveling, I lived in New Zealand at the time, and I was traveling about three hours away from home. And I accidentally bumped into my previous boss, who happened to be in that random town at that time, walking down the street at that time. Absolute plan of God for us to meet. And... I said, hey, what are you doing here? And he's like, what are you doing here? Let's go and have lunch. And previous to this, I, I'd had this pull in my heart from God to, you need to go back to Japan. I've got a work for you to do there. And I was like, God, I've, I'm, I'm, I've loved my job, but I have to quit my job and leave everything behind. And I was really struggling. This, my, my boss, at the time I last saw him, he wasn't super, super strong with God. And when we went down and we sat at the cafe, he just opened up and just blasted me like a preacher on fire because I shared with him about my thoughts and he's like, yes, you should go, blah, 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 blah. And he was just going, going, God says this and God says that. And he said, I've been reading this book at the moment by Rick Warren called A Purpose Driven Church. And he shared with me a concept that really helped me step across that faith line. And I want to share it with you this morning. The quote was, God, not you, makes the waves. Okay, we're doing a surfing analogy, okay? God is the one who makes the waves. You, your job is to look out for, catch and ride his waves that he sends your way. And this really struck, struck, struck me. I knew God wanted me in Japan, so I was asking God, what am I going to do there? I, I had no idea what I was going to do when I went there. And he didn't answer me. And, and, and so I started trying to make my own plans and I was just freaking out. But in my heart, God said, I'm not asking you to make the waves. You're trying to create those waves. Just get on the wave and trust me. My friend could see that I was hesitating accepting God's call because I couldn't see what God was calling me to. Serving God is not an action it's a faith journey and a lifestyle, a way that we face every day. It's about freeing ourselves and our time and then looking what God sends our way, looking for those waves, living differently, living with our eyes up to the horizon, looking for what service opportunity he sends us. And with this in mind, I know I'm, I'm running out of time, with this in mind, we can see through so many stories in the Bible, and you could list off 10, where God doesn't tell the next step he just says, get in, get in, you know, pack up your things and go to that land. Or, or, you know, just absolutely no details. 
And I want to quickly just touch on the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, which is in Acts um, 8.26. And I'm, just, I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm going to assume that you're familiar with it. And what God said to Philip was, go and stand near, the, go to the chariot. Okay? Just go and I will lead you. All right? The, the angel didn't tell him what was coming next. And I know that Philip would have been asking, why stand next to the chariot? What's going to happen? Is this it? Is my time up? God could have been sending him there because the wheel was going to fall off and he could have been there just in time to save it. Or maybe the horse was about to fall down and, and Philip's dad was a, a vet and he knew enough just to save the horse. It could have been that the Ethiopian was going to have a heart attack and he could have caught him and healed him. God doesn't always tell us in advance. The fact is that Philip obeyed. That is our job, to obey. And he was standing next to the chariot, ready to serve and ready to tell that man about God. When the need arose and it was presented to him, he swung into action as if it was natural. God sent the wave, Philip grabbed his board, and he was out there. God could have used an angel to do that, couldn't he? But he chose to use us to reach others. As humans, I know that we're designed to serve. Why? Because we have two hands and two feet. And because Jesus himself showed us what true love and charity was when he laid down his life for us. And that is the ultimate display of service, isn't it? Ellen White says, Eternity can never fathom the depth of love revealed in the cross of Calvary. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus calls us to follow his example. <clears throat> God isn't calling us all to go out and die for someone today. But he showed us in the clearest way possible what it really means to put others first. To serve, no matter what, no excuses. Think of all the beautiful images that God has left us with in the life of Jesus. The lady caught in adultery. Jesus washing Peter's feet. Jesus gathering the little children to say, no, don't send them away, let them come to me. Healing the blind man, the lame, the destitute. What a beautiful picture and example he set of how we should be treating others and those within our churches and within our families. I'd like you all, as a final verse, to turn with me to Isaiah 6 verse 8. Isaiah 6, verse 8. Are you all there? I want you to all be there for this one. Isaiah 6, verse 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who is there to send? I have work to do. Who is there to send? And who will go for us? If you hear the voice of God calling in your heart this morning and pressing you, I invite you to stand up with me. If you can feel the conviction in your heart that something has got to change in your life in order for you to get in the ocean and catch those waves, I would like you to stand just where you are with me. If you want to make a choice to be more intentional about asking God to give you opportunities in your life every day, I'd like to ask you to stand. And I invite you to grab your Bibles and read with me the rest of that verse. And then I said what? Here I am, send me. Thank you very much. You can take a seat. Many feel that it would be a great privilege to visit the scenes of Jesus' life on earth, to walk where he walked, to look upon the lake beside where he loved to teach to walk through the hills and the valleys on which his eyes often rested. But we don't need to go to Nazareth, to Capernaum, to Bethany, in order to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We can find his footprints beside the bed of the sick. 
in the hovels of poverty, in the crowded alleys of the largest cities, in the earthquakes, and in every place where there are human hearts that are hurting, in doing as Jesus did while on this earth, we shall walk in his steps and serve our King who saved us so that we can serve others. Let's pray. Dear wonderful Father, we thank you so much that you've given us as humans the privilege to serve other people. And Lord, that looks like something different for everyone in every, every single day of their lives. And Lord, we just want to lift up our hearts to you and our hands and our feet. We pray that you give us many opportunities every day to reach out, to love on someone, to, to, to smile, to, to impact someone else's life in a, in a positive way so that we may have an opportunity to share your love. We thank you that you've given us this blessed opportunity to serve you as our King. We leave our hearts in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.